we're very blessed. Get to this point, a lot of people, you know, counted us out, but that locker room believed, believed in each other, believed in me, and uh, I got a great staff and, and great players, and, and we found a way to get it done. Proud of the way our players, coaches, everybody competed uh, for 60 minutes. Just, um, just wasn't wasn't quite enough. Uh, we didn't weren't able to to perform at our best. You know, you can't win the game if you're not in the game, and you know you play to win, and sometimes you lose. And I'm um, disappointed. Wish we could have done a better job, but we fought to the end. And uh, I might give the Eagles a lot of credit. They played a great game. They got a great team, and uh, those guys played really well. All right, Chris, we'll start with this. I would imagine you were maybe a little bit surprised with the way that the Eagles did this. How did they pull off this upset? Well, I think you can't give Doug Peterson enough credit for the game that he called and the situations that he put Nick Foles in. And Nick Foles talked about it after the game. He said that our coaching staff does a great job in game preparation and, and not overhauling the offense, but tweaking the offense, putting in things that he's comfortable executing. And it showed early in that game. Yes. To open up the game with three straight passes to get Nick Foles into a rhythm, I think Doug Peterson Peterson had the right idea, and I think that showed and proved dividends later on in that ball game. You saw that he was comfortable. They were able to execute in the critical phases of the game. Nick, you mentioned it earlier, in leverage situations, trying to convert four yeah. first downs, 12 or 18. So that's exactly what you're looking for, and you can't express enough how important the confidence aspect of this thing is. And so when you have a quarterback playing at that high of a level, it just breeds that kind of confidence on your team. Uh, walk us through the late game adjustments. Brandon Graham, defensive end, people know him predominantly. They slide him inside. What happens on that play? Well, here's the thing. Shaq Mason is playing guard for a reason because he can't block in space. Otherwise, he'd be playing offensive tackle. So what you have is a situation where Fletcher Cox is getting double teamed. And so the other three amigos up front, they got one-on-ones. They got to get home. And that's exactly what Brandon Graham did. They slid him inside. So you're isolating one of your best pass rushes. He led the team in sacks on a guard who's not good in space. And he was able to have a two-way go. He beat him around the edge in the B gap. And then he made a great play on the ball. I thought it was pretty good ball security by Tom Brady in the pocket, but Brandon Graham just made an incredible play. And that's the thing about pass rush, right? Everybody wants to talk about sack numbers, but it's not necessarily the number of sacks you get. It's about being able to generate pressure at the right time in a game. And so when you have an opportunity to get those third down sacks, end of half, end of game sacks, those count more. And we talked about it last week. I said the magic number for the Philadelphia Eagles defensive line was going to be eight plus quarterback hits. They got nine in this game. They won the ball game. So I w we're going to talk about Nick Foles in a little bit. So I want to mention three names that I think were key, and one of which has not been mentioned yet on this show. First name is Zach Ertz, who's been the most reliable receiver. I know he plays tight end, but the most reliable pass catcher, I should say, on the Eagles all year long. On the biggest drive of their season, the, oh, the first drive they had the ball where they were trailing in the Super Bowl, down 33-32. What'd they do on third down? They went to Zach Ertz. What'd they do on fourth down? They went to Zach Ertz. What'd they do for the touchdown? They went to Zach Ertz. On their three biggest plays, on their biggest drive, a 14-play, 75-yard, seven-minute drive, Zach Ertz took them home. So there's one name. The other name is a name we've talked about a lot, Doug Peterson. Man, he's talking about a second-year coach, a guy who came into this year mm -hmm. with real questions about Man, why, the Eagles wanted, remember, going into this year, we thought Ben McAdoo was the coach du jour. The Eagles tried to get Ben McAdoo. Yep. They couldn't. Doug Peterson, did they hire the wrong guy? Uh, oh, is he just riding off Carson Wentz? No, no, no. Doug Peterson goes into this game full aggression and maybe the gutsiest play call I've ever seen in the Super Bowl, the throw to Nick Foles on fourth down. And the last name I want to mention, one we haven't mentioned yet, Howie Roseman. The GM of this football mm -hmm. team who went out and got Alshon Jeffrey. Okay, Chicago, you don't want this talented young wide receiver. Mm -hmm. We're going to pair him with our talented young quarterback. Mid-season, all right, you know what? We have the best record in football. We're not done. Let's go get Jay Ajayi. We're going to have enough depth on our offensive line that somehow we can lose potential future Hall of Famer Jason Peters and have a guy come in and be okay. Like, so I think all three of those guys, enormous reasons why the Eagles are sitting their champions today. 
the one thing we said the Patriots do better than anyone else is, is they figure out who your best guy is and they take him out. And it becomes a non-factor. And we all agree that Zach Ertz, you know, he's a Super Bowl tight end. He led the team receptions and receiving yards. Why weren't the Patriots able to contain or stop Zach Ertz? Well, this is the thing, because they did a lot what the Patriots do. They changed their game plan. They came out. Who are they throwing the ball? Okay. Getting the ball to Jeffries. Getting it to him. Running the ball. We didn't mention the offensive line. They averaged 6.1 yards per rush. Yeah. And it wasn't like they only had 15 rushes. 27 for 164. I mean, that offensive line, it's not sexy. They don't make the, the, the headlines. But, man, they did a job on New England. I mean, they wore them out, gave Nick Foles enough time in pass coverage. There were three phases to that passing game. First started with Jeffries. He set the table, switched over to Nelson Aguilar, and then we had Zach Ertz put him to sleep at the end. So that game planning and how they adjusted going throughout the game, they couldn't. They had six receivers that had more than three catches. It's hard to defend. Man, where are they going? Oh, they're going over here. Oh, now they're going back to someone else. And a constant barrage of three running backs. Boom, boom, boom. And as receivers out of the backfield. All these things led to a great performance by the Philadelphia, especially their offense. And you got to be able to sprinkle the love around. It'd be easy to say, oh, Nick Foles, but Nick Foles. But you can't do it without the receiving core, sure. offensive line, and the, and, the, and the three running backs that had an impact on this game. No, you're right, CC, and I'm glad you gave the big guys some love because football comes down to being able to block and being able to tackle. And I think that those were the situations that the Philadelphia Eagles excelled in. If you look at the New England Patriots' second offensive possession on that third down play, Ronnie McLeod was able to make the tackle on Brandon Cooks when he tried to go over the top. That forced a field goal attempt, which they ended up missing. That's three points off the board. And then if you look at the Philadelphia Eagles, first possession in the second half, that third and six from their own 19, Nelson Aguilar was able to break that tackle from Batamosi and end up converting for a first down. They go back and they answer New England Patriots touchdown score with a touchdown score of their own. So you never know when those high leverage situations are going to come up, but it goes back to the fundamentals of football and the team that executed the fundamentals at the higher level won the game well, last night. And one other underrated play of this game, after the strip set, the Pats still have the two-minute warning and a timeout. They hold Philly to a three-and-out. It's a five-point game. Elliott comes out there for a 46-yard field goal. He misses that field goal. A rookie. Oh, a rookie. He misses that field goal. All of a sudden, Tom Brady's with the ball right around the 35-yard line. Man. Minute 10 left. Who the hell knows what happens? Man. Like Yeah, Doug Peterson, them, even at that point with the rookie kicker, they get that score. They, they, they're able to, to, to get the margin that we, we end up being the final score, but then they follow that up. We're not going to play afraid. They kick the ball short. Their kicker's been kicking the ball through the end zone. They kick it short to run time off the clock. New England panics, tries to run a reverse, has the offense backed up. So, man, Philadelphia, from the beginning to the end, it was very, very calculated, but they dominated most of this football game. Uh, were you surprised also with, with – how many points the Eagles were able to give up and still come out on top? I was, because I didn't anticipate this yeah. being a high-scoring affair. You Might. look at the final score, 41-33. No, yeah, no, if no. I would have saw that, I would have said the New England Patriots won the Super Bowl. But it happens to be that the Philadelphia Eagles were on the winning side of it, and I think that's because Doug Peterson recognized that he had to be aggressive in this game. When you watch their first offensive possession, they went down and they kicked the field goal. I was saying to myself at home, I said, man, they got to convert and score touchdowns, not field goals in the red zone. And so you saw them late in that first half be able to convert on that fourth and one, and Doug Peterson had the play call that he wanted to go to. That trick play ended up being a touchdown pass to Nick Foles. You got to credit him for being able to do that and having the awareness to understand you've got to score touchdowns in the red zone going up against New England. And CC, one unintended consequence of this game that you're going to like a lot. No football teams anymore get to use the injury excuse. Oh, you lost your quarterback? We lost our MVP, won the Super Bowl. Oh, you lost your running back? We lost Aaron Sproles for the year. Corey Clement filled in, won the Super Bowl. Oh, you lost your left tackle? We lost a future Hall of Famer, won the Super Bowl. Lost, lost our middle linebacker? Oh, we won the Super So, I mean, the, the Eagles, they didn't have good injury luck. They actually had awful injury luck all year, up to and including their most important player, won the damn Super Bowl. Just real quick about um, aggressive play calling. Uh, uh, sometimes... 
you know, fans watch that and pundits watch it and, like, analysts watch it and they're like, oh, the aggressive play calling. What does it do for the players on the field? Because they know it's happening. I mean, how, how much confidence does that instill in their coach knowing that he's calling a full, non-scaled back game plan for your backup quarterback? All, all guys like aggressive game plans until it starts going bad. And they'll be like, hey, man, you're a little too aggressive. <laughs> a little too aggressive. <laughs> Just like we tell you, gentlemen, just dial it back. Okay, dial it back. Just walk it back. Walk it back. Well. Well. Walk it back. Well. When it's going well, well. and the people it's are racks laughing racks and everything. Racks, racks on racks on yeah. racks. There you and, go. But, I'm yoked. If not, nope. we got to dial it back. back. Yeah. Nah, nah, Absolutely. Dial it's about back. success. Thank Let's you. yam it up, guys. Chris, stick around. Let's go yam. Coming up, how was Nick Foles able to go from backup to Super Bowl?